You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is August 28, 2023. Our topic today, Update in Aspirin Exacerbated Respiratory Disease, or AERD. Our presenter is Dr. Drew White. He's the director of the AERD program and fellowship program director at Scripps Clinic in La Jolla, California. So uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Conferences Online and Allergy. Today is August 28th. Uh, We have two presentations for you today. Um, Our first is uh, Dr. Andrew White. Um, Dr. White uh, did his internal medicine training in the Navy, and then he went on to Scripps Clinic for his Allergy and Immunology Fellowship. Uh, He is the current fellowship program director and the head of the Uh, Aspirin Exacerbated Respiratory Disease Clinic, and he's going to give us an update on AERD. Thank you. All right, everyone. Thank you. Um, Get started here. I do have this uh, disclosure slide, um, and we are going to be talking a bit at the end about some of the biologics and therapies, so um, just uh, making sure that you're aware of this. Here's the uh, learning objectives. We're going to talk about you know, why it's still important to identify AERD patients, um, talk about some of the different therapies in AERD, and then uh, describe some of the new updates in our understanding of AERD pathophysiology. Um, I have this weird subtitles. Um, is that on on your end? I don't turn that off. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, um, AERD is a really fascinating uh, condition. You all know that it's uh, characterized by these top three uh, components. They have uh, severe nasal um, polyposis, asthma, which is often severe, and then it's defined by these reactions to um, to aspirin or NSAIDs. And then there's some other um, interesting features about this condition. These patients um, almost always present in adulthood. And about half of them will describe that it started after they got a upper respiratory tract type of infection, uh, suggesting maybe there's some sort of a viral trigger for this. Um, A large number of patients experience alcohol um, reactivity, meaning if they drink alcohol, they'll end up having um, rhinitis symptoms or asthma symptoms. There's an interestingly um, high, higher than normal uh, higher than would be normally expected rate of coronary vasospasm in this population. So these are patients who go to the ER with chest pain. They have a bump in their troponin. It looks like an acute coronary syndrome, and then they have a clean calf. Um, esophageal eosinophilia has been described now um, in many patients. And then some other uh, another interesting um, set of symptoms is this um, uh, a notable finding in, in um, women where they have perimenstrual asthma, but even perimenstrual sinus symptoms. So as their asthma flares up, they are also having worsening sinus um, rhinitis symptoms, uh, nasal congestion, et cetera. So we should be thinking about AERD uh, as a syndrome that also invo- involves um, extra respiratory manifestations. There's prevalence. If you look at all asthmatics, it's about 8% of asthmatics, uh, but that number uh, doubles once you're looking at a severe asthma population. So if you look at like the Tenor study, uh, which is uh, specifically looking at severe asthmatics, 15% of them have severe, uh, have AERD. And once you look at patients that have both asthma and nasal polyposis, it's about a third of that group. And if you look at the registry studies for the biologics for nasal polyps, it turns out that that's about the exact number that were um, in uh, of AERD patients that were enrolled in those studies. About uh, 25 to 30 percent of those studies contained AERD patients. This is a disease that's um, that can be quite severe, Um, and if you think about Uh, patients maybe that have had the worst polyps you've ever seen or some more uh, catastrophic um, extension of nasal polyps, it's almost always going to be AERD patients. Um, This is a patient here on the right where you can see there's a large polyp that actually had 
um, a rupture through the orbital rim and the polyp is in the, 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 or, the orbit itself. Uh, and he actually presented to me with some vision changes and had noticeable proptosis on exam. This other um, image on the left is a patient that had polyps that had actually extended out um, uh, from her eustachian tube out and uh, ruptured out through her tympanic membrane. So you could see her polyps on an ear exam. Uh, and other cases like this have also been reported in the literature. So uh, this just speaks to the fact that this disease can be, although this is really rare, um, can be really uh, uh, markedly severe. And we know that this is the case when we think about our, our AERD patients uh, and their sinus disease. They tend to have worse sinus disease. Their smell score is worse compared to aspirin tolerant. Um, the aggressive polyps I just highlighted. And these patients are much more likely to need surgery. I think things will change, you know, as we have so many new therapies. Uh, but this is back in the in the days before aspirin therapy was a commonly used um, entity and before biologics. And these patients would get surgery about 10 times as often as patients without AERD. And I think the big thing here also is the rate of polyp recurrence, because you start to question the futility of surgery if the patient feels great for a month and then they immediately start to reform polyps. Um, you know, there's there's minimal need to keep going in and doing surgery if that's the, the only outcome you get. For asthma, um, this also has a uh, the, the presence of AERD has a big effect. So uh, these are also older studies. Again, now in the age of the biologics and all the other therapies we have, we don't see some of these more severe manifestations, but um, patients with AERD were much more likely to have had um, severe exacerbations ending up in the ICU, much more likely to have uh, near fatal asthma in a Japanese population, and these patients were also much more likely to be on daily steroids. Up to half of a group in a, in a U.S. series were uh, needed um, daily corticosteroids to control their disease. The um, patients have uh, uh, NSAID reactions as a defining characteristic of their of their illness, and this is uh, centered on COX-1. So anything that inhibits COX-1 will cause uh, reaction. This does not involve IgE. It doesn't involve adaptive immunity. So there's no prior sensitization. It can occur on the very first exposure. And anything that uh, works around COX-1, like the selective COX-2 inhibitors, are going to typically be well tolerated um, in patients with AERD. Um, uh, acetaminophen is usually uh, tolerated, but it does have some COX-1 effect um, as you approach 1,000 milligrams. And so some patients will occasionally describe this, maybe about a third of patients, but usually the reactions are much more mild. But it shouldn't throw you off if you have a patient who tells you that they react to acetaminophen. On the left and the right are two um, ways to think about your index of suspicion. So if you have a patient where you're, you're really not sure, this is where you're going to be doing a diagnostic challenge. Um, and then if you feel very, very confident based on the history, then you would say the patient likely has AERD. And if you're considering aspirin desensitization, you would just move on to that. So if we look at some of these characteristics here on the left, patients that only had one reaction to an NSAID, if their symptoms were minor, if their symptoms were atypical, maybe they had like a you know, severe headache or a skin rash, and they're not really describing respiratory symptoms, or they had a flare-up that lasted for more than 24 hours, that would all really argue against AERD, and you'd probably want to do a challenge. And also, if they have really minimal polyp burden, that's pretty unusual for AERD, and so that would, again, raise my uh, suspicion. On the other side, um, if you've had two or more reactions to different NSAIDs, so the patient tells you they reacted to aspirin and ibuprofen, that um, uh, is, um, is definitely a compelling history. If they had to go to the hospital, we know that most of those patients, uh, about 99% of them, will have a positive aspirin challenge. The reactions usually should be upper and lower and last less than six hours, and if they have severe polyps, so as these features here on the right add up, you can probably just diagnose those patients with AERD. Next two slides talk about 
some uh, variability though in our ability to interpret the aspirin challenge. It sometimes can be negative, even in a patient with AERD. And you just need to consider that. Um, this is an older study, 10 patients that underwent a aspirin challenge. They then um, uh, repeated the challenge, this time with Montelukast on board, and all of the patients but one reacted. So it didn't have a huge effect, but there was one patient that had no reaction to the second challenge. And so this does sh show us that monolucast um, can have a blocking effect and potentially silence the reaction. This is another uh, study looking at a group of patients that had um, uh, initially a negative challenge. And then when they rechallenged and changed some of the pretreatment, either removed the montelukast or started at a higher dose, those patients all went on to have a positive challenge. Um, and these were patients all that had a pretty compelling history. Um, and this is um, something that was also shown if you, uh, old, real old study from Poland, if you just take patients and very, very, very slowly increase the dose, you can sometimes get them to tolerate a full dose, even though you know that they've uh, proven to be positive. And then the final um, thing that really can modify this is surgery. This was a really uh, cool study that Alina Jershaw did where they uh, looked at the reactivity uh, of an aspirin challenge before surgery and after surgery. That's what you see here on the right. Before surgery, you can see prostaglandin D metabolite goes up uh, markedly, goes up uh, to a much lower degree after surgery. And what that translated to is that the challenge now was negative in um, uh, a quarter of the patients. So they're so quote unquote AERD went away, um, but we know that they have AERD. It's just that the polyp burden itself seems to be an essential part of fueling that reaction. So we need to consider that if you're doing challenges right after, you know, the only challenge the patient has is right after a surgery. Another clue that we can think of for uh, diagnosing our AERD patients is alcohol reactivity. This is something we noticed about 15 years ago uh, that most of our patients would tell us that they had stopped drinking because it was uncomfortable. They'd have asthma symptoms, they'd have rhinitis symptoms. So this is 83% um, uh, of the AERD patients would experience this. And although it definitely can happen in these other populations, it's much less common in the aspirin tolerant asthma and nasal polyp population. I'm not going to spend a ton of time going over the um, mechanisms here. Uh, this is a great paper if you're interested. Uh, Tanya Laidlaw was the uh, first author. It's an England Journal article going over mechanisms um, in AERD. And on the left is the baseline state. So prostaglandin E2 is critical at holding back uh, the inflammation that is uh, uh, wanting to be produced by these cells. Um, specifically looking here at leukotrienes. Once you block COX-1, even at low dose, you lose that protective effect. And so that translates into this exaggerated production of the systemic leukotrienes. That's going to cause uh, worsening airflow obstruction. It's going to increase alarm in production, which we know is critical to fueling the rest of this pathway. And so this is a very tenuous balance that seems to be held in place at baseline by this low level of prostaglandin E2 and is very vulnerable to the COX-1 effect. These are the main cells that are important. We know mast cell, ILC2 cells, and eosinophils are real central. Um, and there's a very strong interplay and overlap between these, um, these cells. You can see that a lot of these mediators can act on multiple cells and actually lead to a feed forward sort of um, inflammation where you know, alarm and activation at the ILC2 is going to activate um, IL5 and IL13, which is going to activate the eosinophil. That's going to have um, an effect on PGD2, and that cycle can just um, circulate. Um, interestingly, polymorphonuclear cells are also important. Um, on their own, they cannot produce leukotrienes, um, and platelets on their own cannot produce leukotrienes but these platelets can adhere to the, the polymorphonuclear cell and they can actually shuttle some of their contents back and forth and provide what each of the cells cannot do on its own. And so in this 
setting, these adherent platelets can also drive a lot of the um, uh, increase in the cystineolocotrienes, including LTE4, which now has its own receptor, um, cystlt 3 which is involved in this mucin release and um, epithelial homeostasis. Okay, so we're going to talk now more clinically about AERD. This is what a lot of patients um, experience in the course of their illness. They get diagnosed with polyps, they have surgery, their polyps start to come back. They, for periods of time, get steroids to try to um, debulk and give them symptom relief. As that happens, their asthma tends to get worse. Then we get to a point where we feel like they need surgery. So they get surgery again. And if someone doesn't recognize that they have AERD or doesn't think through the long-term trajectory of that particular patient that, you know, now that they've had rapid polyp recurrence, uh, we need to do something different, they end up on this cycle. And again, before we had biologic options and used aspirin therapy a lot, um, this would be the natural um, history we would hear of patients. And it wasn't unusual for us to have patients that had had you know, 8, 10, 12 sinus surgeries, um, every every couple of years they would go in for surgery. There's a lot of treatment options now for AERD. We've got uh, a more typical um, endoscopic sinus surgery. And then there's something called a full house FES or a draft three or frontal drill out. These are usually surgeries that are add on after a patient's failed an initial surgery. We're not gonna talk more about that, but uh, some centers really recommend this as a treatment um, up front uh, uh, from a surgical perspective for AERD. We've got our leukotriene modifier drugs, so monolucast and zephyrlocast, which are the uh, receptor blockers, and then xyluton, which inhibits 5-lipoxygenase. We've got aspirin therapy after desensitization. We've got our topical steroids in at least three different uh, ways that we can deliver them. We've got diet, which I'm going to have one quick slide on at the end, and then we've got our, our uh, biologics. And if we think through the biologics, you know, they're all um, approved. All of these here are approved for asthma, um, but only three have approval for nasal polyps. And as this is often a really important part of our AERD patients, um, that's why we'll, we'll really just talk about those three today. All right, so this is... Uh, where aspirin um, desensitization actually started from. This is uh, George Fernand Vidal, 1922. He actually published the first case of uh, aspirin desensitization. Uh, at the time, they had you know very poor understanding of what was even going on, but he actually admitted a patient to the hospital and desensitized them. Max Samter um, did a lot of the very first descriptions of this in the English uh, literature, and so the disease carried his name um, for many decades, Samter syndrome. And then Don Stevenson in 1980 was the first to actually publish that you could desensitize patients and they would actually have symptom improvement. That was the first time that that ever was observed. And I'm not going to talk today about how to do the desensitizations. There's lots of protocols out in the literature. Um, I want to spend more time talking about you know, what, what we use, uh, why we think about some of the different options that we have. And I do want to clue you in, though, to um, a terminology. So um, aspirin desensitization is now the term that we use to describe the actual event of desensitizing the patient. And then aspirin therapy after desensitization is what we refer to when we send patients home on aspirin with the attempt to control their disease. So there still is some, I think, skepticism about aspirin therapy after desensitization. Um, this slide hopefully will put that to rest um, if, if you have skepticism. Um, it's now been described in about a thousand patients in the literature. There's four, I'm sorry, five randomized double blind placebo controlled trials and one meta analysis. The meta analysis here you can see shows improvement for quality of life and symptoms. There's a strong effect on polyp growth rate, um, se secondary beneficial effect on asthma symptoms. It is dose dependent, um, which is what we've always uh, known about this. You need to be at you know, higher doses to get the effect. Um, and then a modest side effect profile. You do see the adverse events here, usually GI upset 
This is from the IFAR um, guidelines um, in 2021. This is a very large international consensus on um, treatment of rhinosinusitis. Um, and this uh, document states that aspirin desensitization followed by aspirin therapy is one of the very few disease modifying medical treatment options available for patients with AERD should be considered in AERD patients after surgical removal to prevent recurrence. So why does it work? This is a question that has confounded us ever since 1980. Um, now that we know it works, we've spent decades trying to understand why it works. And this is one, I think, of the more interesting studies to kind of help to shed light on that. If you look um, at this um, um, study, what they did is they looked at patients in red here um, in uh, AERD at baseline and then AERD at high dose of aspirin. Those are the two um, uh, reds. The other uh, in gray are aspirin tolerant asthmatics. These are patients that we would not expect would have benefit by being on aspirin. And then these were all desensitized and followed. And in the terms of the aspirin tolerant asthma, they just were started on aspirin. And you can see that um, several of the things that go along with T2 inflammation actually got worse. The eosinophil count went up on aspirin therapy. Their tryptase um, went up on aspirin therapy. And so that's the opposite of what you would think if it's going to have a beneficial effect. But if you look here at um, the, the right side, you can see that prostaglandin D metabolite went down. And that's possibly the main explanation here. We know that this is a super important mediator um, in type 2 disease, and maybe this is so important in the ERD that reducing it on aspirin would lead to enough symptom improvement to help control their disease. We know PGD2 is very important in AERD. Um, these are the GI reactors. So these are patients where as you're desensitizing them or challenging them, they have really significant GI upset. It almost looks like pancreatitis, this very severe, boring epigastric pain. They get quite flushed. And these patients have a higher level of prostaglandin D, and that is not suppressed as they're taking their aspirin. Aspirin is going to naturally cause that um, PGD2 to go down because of, of its effect on COX-1. That doesn't seem to happen, um, at least early on in these patients. So this really outlines that PGD2 is critically important. Leukotrienes are critically important. We know this as well. These are older studies. So this is on the left here looking at Xyluton. Um, and you can actually even see that AERD patients have significant improvement in their sense of smell with Xyluton. It's a med we hardly ever use anymore. Um, um, it sort of got lost, I think, because it was difficult to have access to for quite some time, um, but, but definitely has shown to be beneficial and lower the levels of the leukotriene um, E4 level. And then on Montelukast, you can see here that these patients also had a uh, significant improvement in their asthma control. I would say over the years, we've noticed that the benefit of Montelukast doesn't seem to be particularly striking in terms of controlling the disease with AERD. Um, we use it in everybody, at least up front, to see if it helps, but it doesn't always help. And then when we're doing the aspirin challenge or desensitization, uh, Montelukast seems to offer a lot of benefit to the um, uh, lower airways, helps prevent these really strong drops in FEV1. And then finally, this study looks at the effects of aspirin therapy on the SysLT1 receptor. This is an older study from the New England Journal where they actually were using nasal aspirin lysine uh, sprayed directly into the nose. These patients with AERD had a higher level of um, uh, their SysLT1 receptor, and then that receptor and their SysLT level, uh, their leukotriene C4 level, both went down on therapy. Um, and this was something that was unique to the AERD patients and not seen in the um, aspirin tolerant patients. So all of these effects lead, you know, to the summary here is that uh, we know that leukotriene E4 excretion really remains elevated in these patients. But there's somehow less of an effect, less of an end organ effect um, to that when patients are on aspirin. So that's potentially one explanation here for why these patients get better. 
they have less of an effect of the systemic oligotrienes. It may be that prostaglandin D2 is real critically important, and just simply the effect of COX-1 blocking that can lead to uh, uh, lower levels, and that, that may really be one of the main benefits. And then Larry Borish and Rokatiel and, and others have also uh, done studies that showed STAT-6 uh, and IL-4 levels may be going down on aspirin therapy, and so maybe there's even a more profound and very poorly understood effect of this, uh, of aspirin therapy on that uh, transcription pathway. When we think about treatment for our patients, uh, 8ERD is, is heterogeneous. Um, two studies here to show this. On the left is a, a latent class analysis where they took a, a large number of 8ERD patients and looked at them more from a clinical perspective. And I'll just show you here that, you know, you can see big differences here. A third of the group had mild asthma, low health care use, and they were more likely to be male. And then 40% of that group had very poorly controlled asthma, multiple exacerbations, more likely to be a female. And a third of that group had, had been in the ICU for asthma. So quite a bit of differences, even in AERD. And then when you look at the inflammatory um, uh, characteristics, I think also pretty interesting here, this was summarized by um, Whitney Stevens and Katie Cahill this year and Jackie, where they showed that, you know, you would think in AERD, it would just all be high type type two, um, but it's not. There's definitely components that are type one or type three or other inflammatory pathways um, within this patient group. So we do still need to reserve, you know, suspicion that you know, some of these patients with AERD may have a more a different dominant um, inflammatory pathway, even though the vast majority of the time we can think about this as a predominant type two disease. All right, so you know, obviously, not everyone is an aspirin candidate. Um, for patients that have an unstable unstable asthma or a low FEV1, we're not going to be excited about doing aspirin desensitization. If they're um, unwilling or unable to do a functional endoscopic sinus surgery, um, that's a, a big reason to not put them on aspirin if their nose is going to be full of polyps. Uh, GI disease, blood thinners, pregnancy, upcoming surgery, these are all reasons you not want to put someone on aspirin. And then we know that not everyone even lives near a center that does this routinely. And so, you know, if you're going to tell the patient they've got to drive, you know, three hours or fly somewhere to have this done, um, that's an under, uh, understanding uh, impediment as well. And if we just look at, uh, you know, some of the studies that show the flow of how these patients respond, um, these are uh, older studies, natural history studies that came both out of uh, Europe and, um, and Scripps. So, you know, about two-thirds of patients would have improvement by six months. Uh, they had improvement in polyp recurrence rates, uh, lower um, uh, symptom burdens, but about 15% um, of them, 24 patients out of this group stopped within the first year because of pain, bleeding, or hives. Um, and so that leads, you know, basically to this um, uh, number that about a third of patients either don't get benefit or can't tolerate it. Um, and so that's a, you know, that's a number of patients that still need a different therapy that's not gonna be based on aspirin. When we think about uh, studies in terms of uh, AERD and being really critical, um, I think there's a lot of problems that we have. The studies looking at aspirin therapy are pretty small. That's um, understandable because asking pa finding patients who are willing to undergo desensitizations just for research purposes is obviously not as easy to do. Um, these are often much shorter duration. So um, that's a big difference from what we have in terms of the biologic studies. Most of these studies also are older and the quality of life endpoints were different. So we don't really have the same SNOP22 scores that we do now to compare or upset testing uh, that's often used nowadays for sense of smell. And then the opposite, the biologic studies, you know, these were not set up to look at AERD. They were set up to look at polyps or asthma. Um, and the AERD was not well characterized in those groups. It was just defined by patient reports. So, you know, certainly possible that not all of those patients actually had AERD. 
So I showed you the meta-analysis before of the aspirin data that comes from the same paper. Um, and this is a different way of looking at it. This is um, uh, something that was in uh, Jackie in 2022, meta-analysis of all of the current therapies. This is specifically looking at AERD. And so what you can see here is that for each of these outcomes, the health-related quality of life, symptoms, sense of smell, nasal polyp size, um, each of these treatments here, the different biologics and aspirin are all um, weighted a little bit differently given the, the amount of data that exists and then um, the, the relative benefit. And so what you can see here, if you look at the different biologics compared with aspirin, it looks you know like aspirin has a, a potentially a smaller effect compared to the biologics. Um, and among the biologics, it does appear that um, dupilumab um, may be a little bit more superior, and that was the um, conclusion of the authors. Like dupilumab seemed to be more effective than um, the other biologics or aspirin therapy. Uh, we looked at this in our uh, literature, um, uh, I'm sorry, in our uh, cohort at uh, Scripps, just looking at the effect of adding on biologics in our population of AERD. So almost all of these patients would have had aspirin experience at some point and presumably were not well controlled and thus the reason to start the biologic. Um, and so, you know, within a year of uh, starting the biologic, we're seeing a big effect on um, corticosteroid bursts, antibiotic need, and ER visits. So uh, all important outcomes. We did try to look at this based on the mechanism of the different biologics, but it wasn't really powered for that. So just looking at these, this total um, number. But adding in biologics, uh, no doubt, has been a huge uh, benefit for uh, many of our patients. So I'm going to hit on a couple of the three of the biologics that we use the most. And um, for, uh, we'll start with dupilumab. Uh, so there's, uh, this is phase two data that was reanalyzed, looking at um, aspirin um, uh, AERD specifically. So you're able to look in this paper at the uh, benefit on um, uh, these different outcomes, so nasal polyp score, SNAP22, or UPSIT, and actually look at the AERD population and how that group responded compared to the overall population. And I think, you know, basically what you can see is these patients really had a significant effect and maybe even were more symptomatic to start with. They gave them a little more room for improvement. Uh, they had improvement in their um, asthma outcomes, no, no surprise there. And if you look at the phase three data, um, this group also had a, a total of 79 AERD polyps, uh, AERD patients that had a significant improvement in their nasal polyp score um, at 24 weeks. So pretty you know, good data here that um, our AERD patients are going to get benefit if, we, if they go on um, dupilumab. And what about effect of dupilumab on aspirin sensitivity? This is a question that we don't really have an answer to. We've got some small case series like what I'm showing you here. This is a group of about uh, 30 uh, patients that at baseline had a challenge and then after 24 weeks of dupilumab had a second challenge. And what you can see here is that um, in red, these patients had both upper and lower airway reaction. And now um, that group is now significantly lower from 19 down to six patients. And that's because most of these patients either had nasal reaction alone or were negative. So uh, seven patients went from having a positive challenge to having a negative challenge on dupilumab. So certainly not the majority of the group, it can happen, uh, but we do also need to let our patients know that they can still retain their aspirin sensitivity at least at 24 weeks. What about omalizumab? So let's shift gears to omalizumab. This is a recent study of 16 individuals, and it was uh, double blind um, and crossover. So the patients all had two aspirin challenges, one on omalizumab and then one on placebo. And 10 out of the 16 patients had no symptoms when they were on omalizumab. And there are several other series that, that point to this pretty strong effect of omalizumab being able to block these reactions on the left here are looking at mediators, and so there's a much lower LTE4 level and uh, lower prostaglandin D metabolite levels. With another study 
and looking at the same uh, question, uh, just uh, visualized here a little bit differently. So obolizumab treatment week 24, patients were re-challenged and um, a little over half of the group had complete aspirin tolerance. Um, so this, these studies, I think, share pretty similar findings that a little over half, maybe 60% of patients on omalizumab will uh, lose their aspirin reactivity. This um, is uh, from the same uh, group that published the initial study I mentioned um, with omalizumab. This is an older study, though, where they just took patients and uh, used omalizumab therapy on label. These patients all had AERD. And then what they did is they looked at pre and post levels of a variety of different um, outcomes. So they looked at LTE4 levels, PGD2. These were both significantly reduced on omalizumab. And there were also a lot of important um, improvement in clinical outcomes, including, um, you know, see, you see all these on the left uh, or on the right here are are um, uh, statistically significant. So nasal congestion, anosmia, dyspnea, wheezing, uh, cough. So this really um, demonstrates the potential benefit of omalizumab in uh, some of these aspects of um, our AERD patients. We don't have a lot of information from the registry studies for omalizumab uh, in polyps. So we know that a a little over a quarter of the group had AERD, um, uh, but we don't really know exactly how you know those those patients benefited um, compared to the rest of the group. And then a, a mechanistic um, slide on you know why basophils or mast cells might be important. So this was a study uh, that came from the Northwestern group with Whitney Stevens and. She had been interested in looking at basophils in um, in polyps in AERD and had been surprisingly found that when they stained for this basophil granule 2D7, it was actually much lower in AERD than in um, aspirin tolerant uh, polyp patients. And that was obvious, obviously different what you'd think. You'd think that you know you'd have more basophils. Well, it turns out that those basophils were all actively degranulating, and that's why you don't see that 2D7 staining is because they've degranulated. And so this is their second paper um, where they outline this, that basically the, the lower the 2D7 level, meaning the more um, degranulation you have, the worse um, your blunt McKay score, FEV1 correlates with this. Um, so this has supported the idea that this more active degranulation is going on in AERD and may significantly contribute to um, disease pathogenesis. Basophils also express CRTH2, which is a really important um, uh, receptor. It's a receptor for prostaglandin D. So uh, sort of ties the circle together um, that basophils, potentially mast cells are key players and potentially helps us understand some of the benefit we might be seeing with embolizumab. All right, and switching to now mepolizumab. Um, so uh, 25 to 30% of patients in the Synapse study had AERD. Uh, in, they, in their report, you do see that they've uh, pulled out uh, the, the data for the AERD group. Um, and what we see here is that the benefit, uh, these patients clearly had benefit in terms of the major outcomes that they're looking here. Uh, on the left is uh, nasal obstruction, visual analog scale. And on the right is the endoscopic nasal polyp score. So at least from this uh, subgroup analysis, we can feel a little more confident that um, our AERD patients will also uh, be able to garner benefit from um, uh, if they end up uh, being treated with mepolizumab. This is one of the only other studies that I am aware of, of mepolizumab and AERD. This is a 22 subject group. These patients all were used, uh, were given mepolizumab on label for their asthma component of their AERD. So not necessarily because of their sinus disease, uh, but what you see here is the patients all had, um, I shouldn't say all, but there was a, in general, there was a significant improvement um, in their um, sinonasal outcome test score. Um, the question of nasal congestion improved. 
and also improvement in their sense of smell and taste. Uh, and then this, these patients all had a pretty dramatic lowering of their eosinophil count, as you would expect with the mechanism of action. And why would IL-5 be important? This is a, a really uh, cool study where uh, Katie Bokite and um, her colleagues at Brigham um, looked at um, staining of IL-5 positive antibody producing cells. So thinking like plasma cells and um, in the sinuses, these cells were um, elevated at, uh, at baseline in AERD. These um, uh, plasma cells or antibody expressing cells are uh, I'll specifically uh, being able to be um, uh, highlighted by the IL-5 receptor. And so this provides, I think, another target potentially for um, these IL-5-based therapies and why they might potentially be helpful in sinus disease beyond just the, the obvious effect on eosinophils. But eosinophils themselves may not be uh, that important. So um, this was a study of a compound called dexpramapexol. Sorry, I didn't write that on here. I should have. Dexpramapexol is a uh, investigational uh, pill that was studied for ALS, the neurologic condition, and it failed in the clinical trials for ALS. But they noticed on the safety signal that these patients all had fairly profound eosinophilopenia. And so that has now made this compound, dexpramopexol, an interesting um, target for some of our type 2 diseases that's being studied in asthma currently. And here is um, a, a small case series of patients with polyp disease. So these patients, I believe there were 16 uh, subjects. They were uh, had a sinus biopsy and polyp score done at the beginning and then at the end of treatment. The um, dexpramopexol did a great job of making the eosinophils leave or no longer be present in the polyp. So if you look, A is pre, B is post, and you can see there's very few eosinophils now left in the polyp tissue, the sinus mucosa, but the polyp score was completely unchanged. And so, you know, whether this is um, potentially at the phase of the disease, maybe there's a time where the patients um, where the eosinophil is really important, maybe in the beginning of polyp generation, but once it's fully formed, maybe it's no longer um, required to maintain that. Um, but in any case, um, this helps us understand quite a bit about um, the role of the eosinophil in polyp itself. This study um, was uh, one of the only studies that attempted to try to look at all of the biologics together and their effect on aspirin tolerance. We really need more studies like this. This study came um, uh, from Central America and they had a great study design. They would just randomize patients with polyps uh, with AERD to one of these biologics and then they would actually undergo a pre and post aspirin challenge. Um, unfortunately, what happened to their study is that along the way, when dupilumab became um, approved by their, their country's regulatory agency, they needed to then only use dupilumab going forward in their AERD patients, and so they had to stop their study. Um, so that's why their numbers here are very small. Um, so I think we have to take you know, this all with, with caution, just because there's a very small number in each group. But the numbers also um, fit with some of the other studies I showed you, with maybe you know, 40%, 30 or 40% of patients with dupilumab achieving complete tolerance, 50 to 60% with omalizumab achieving complete tolerance, and then um, lower levels of tolerance with the uh, benralizumab and mepolizumab. Uh, so hopefully someone will do a similar study that's more powered in the future, give us even more information. The final therapy I'm going to talk about is diet. Uh, this came uh, out of Brigham with uh, Dr. Tanya Laidlaw, who's been very interested in this uh, concept. The idea here is that we require um, omega-6 to form the this, this structure of arachidonic acid. And this is the backbone of the prostaglandins and the leukotrienes. So all of this is coming from omega-6. But 
omega-3, which is the healthier omega, this actually um, changes the conformation. And so instead of forming arachidonic acid, we're forming these other um, compounds that have anti-inflammatory effects. So the idea here was to dramatically lower omega-6, dramatically increase omega-3 to sort of starve the system. And they were able to show um, uh, with um, their analysis of these um, compounds that they were able to do that, um, that the, the diet actually did make this change. And then the patients actually did have an improvement in their SNOP22 score and their ACQ score. So this is a viable option for some patients. They have to be very motivated. It's a pretty tough diet to stick with. Um, and if, but if you're interested or if a patient's interested, they have a lot of information in that um, publication on how to do it. And there's also some information on the uh, Samter Society uh, webpage. Um, so I generally will refer some of my motivated patients in that, um, in that avenue. All right, last few uh, slides. So how do we put this all together? We've got aspirin therapy, we've got our biologics. How do we, how do we choose? We don't have a lot of data on um, how to, you know, what happens as we try to incorporate this. I'm going to share just two slides uh, or two studies here. The first comes from Penn. Um, at Penn, they have an integrated rhinology and allergy clinic. And so their patients, um, you know, are lucky that they get to have this combined approach. They uh, uh, have published on their data of doing surgery first, so debulking the patient and then putting them on aspirin therapy. And in their series of 103 patients, only two patients um, uh, required um, escalating to a biologic at six months. So this shows that even in the age of biologics, um, aspirin therapy as the initial treatment option still can be very appropriate. The second study is this real world cross section. This came from Brigham. And uh, if you looked at the patients who had undergone aspirin therapy, uh, this is not any sort of controlled study. This is just what happened to the patients and as they and their doctor went through with their care, how they decided to do things. So about 20% ended up going on a biologic and stopping aspirin. So presumably the aspirin didn't work or maybe they had side effects. But 75% of the group stayed on aspirin. And of that 75%, three quarters of the group remained on aspirin monotherapy, despite biologics all being on the market and being accessible. And so what this tells me is that these patients were probably pretty happy. They didn't see a need to go on to aspirin, uh, to, to biologic therapy or switch. And um, maybe we should try to find these patients on the front end of their illness and offer them this to start with. And if they're doing great, then this could be a nice simple, easy, cheap alternative for them going forward. And then the other 25%, they stayed on aspirin. Presumably they felt that the aspirin was beneficial, but wanted to add a biologic. So, you know, the questions that come up now, I think as we are going through um, how to stratify what we do with our patients, you know, how much is your sense of smell worth? What if you're doing pretty well, but the last thing um, that we haven't been able to improve is your anosmia. And is that, you know, worth going on a biologic? How many surgeries are too many? Should all patients have at least one surgery? Should all patients have a revision surgery before we move on to a biologic? And then same thing with steroid bursts. Um, you know, almost all these patients are going to be getting steroid bursts, but you know, is one steroid burst per year keeping them controlled? Is that okay in the long run? So I think these are some of the, you know, dilemmas that we face as we think about, you know, whether to deem our treatments a failure or whether it's a, su a success. This is a yardstick document, uh, Larry Borish is first author on this, and this is looking for, um, at polyps, uh, uh, big picture, all nasal polyp comers, but I'll point you out there to the bottom left where he's pulled out the ERD section and um, made it clear that these uh, therapies are not listed in any order of recommendation. And so they include surgery, biologics, the oral steroids, aspirin therapy, and then uh, the leukotriene blockers. So, but since we don't have any recommended order of this, it leaves us up to you. And as you talk through with the patients and 
what their values are and what they care about and what they have access to, um, insurance coverage, et cetera, all of that's probably going to translate into how you guide them through these different um, main treatment options that we have. These are the obvious uh, main points that we think of as we are factoring um, our decision making. We're thinking about the patient's asthma, their lung function, their nasal polyps, their sense of smell, and then how important it is for them to be able to take aspirin or NSAIDs. We have lots of biologics now, uh, three biologics that have the benefit to help these top symptoms, but we know that not all of them are going to be able to get the patient to tolerate aspirin. And then we have to balance this with cost and long-term safety. What if patients need aspirin for cardioprotection? That changes the conversation quite a bit. Um, and then what about if they do need other NSAIDs for some reason, um, you know, whether we need to desensitize them to that. So these are all the considerations. Um, and as I meet a new patient, I'm trying to go through this list and understand what's most important to them. So this is my final slide. I think this is, you know, one way to think through a work through, work workflow. Um, uh, this is uh, published in Jackie in 2021. And so you can start off with the AERD patient. Are their symptoms well controlled? So is their asthma well controlled and they have a low burden of sinus symptoms? If yes, then, you know, that's when you might want to think about putting them on aspirin. Um, their, their sinus disease uh, is, is likely uh, low grade and so you can help prevent it from getting worse adding aspirin it's a low cost and simple intervention you're going to continue that you're going to uh, follow them up add topical steroids and then probably the biggest um, endpoints are whether their polyp um, disease is is controlled or if they're having recurrence and is their asthma controlled and so if they have polyp recurrence or their asthma is poorly controlled at that point, you'd move on to adding a biologic. Now, on the other side here, if their symptoms are not well controlled, you're going to start escalating up, you know, adding in different topical steroids. You're going to be thinking pretty early on about surgery. And so you can see here um, at, at that point after surgery, if they have uh, good control and their asthma is sufficiently controlled, then you're going to uh, consider aspirin therapy. If after surgery, their asthma is not controlled, then you're really probably gonna think about moving on to a biologic at that point. So these are the ways to think about it. I think the challenge is a lot of our eight year B patients, you know, they don't come in in a nice easy box in terms of where they're at. They may have mild polyp burden. And so you're sort of debating whether they should get surgery first or not. And then the patient may have their own, you know, goals and objectives about therapy. They may not want to go on aspirin. They may not want to go on a biologic. So all of this really can change quite a bit how the conversation goes. Um, you know, but the summary that I'll say, the greatest thing here is that these patients now have so many different treatment options. And 10 or 15 years ago, we had very few options to offer these patients. And if they failed aspirin therapy, we were, you know, moving on to, um, to, uh, you know, recurrent surgery and steroids as our only way to, to help uh, maintain them. So I will leave it at that. Um, uh, ha happy to take a few questions if there are any. Yep, looks like I got about five minutes. Okay, so let's open questions to the audience, please. All right, while they're thinking about it, I have a few for you. Um, I live in a, the land of pediatrics, and my adult exposure was many years ago. And I remember seeing a young 23-year-old college student at the time who had had four surgeries already on his polyps and I felt trapped in where to go at the time. Obviously, there are no biologics available and how many surgeries can one have at that time. Um, I don't recall that he had the aspirin sensitivity on that too, but it was like, wow, what a burden. Um, since then, I've been in pediatrics, so I don't have a lot of exposure anymore. So I wanted to ask on, if you have an, a patient with known AERD who has never tried COX-2, but let's say is venturing on and may need that, do you do the uh, COX-2 challenge under observation? In other words, bring them into the clinic, or is that something that you could have that conversation with the patient and consider trying at home? Yeah, I think I think both are appropriate. The COX-2 are so safe um, that it, it it is totally reasonable to to have them do it at home. I, I think 
there are you know, scattered case reports of people still reacting. And so we often will just do a full dose challenge in the office with a one hour observation um, and uh, and just leave it at that. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, if you talk with the patient and um, especially if their like initial reaction to aspirin was not super severe, that I think it's totally reasonable. They and they should be encouraged. It's really unlikely that they'll have any symptoms at all. Yeah. And would you do the same thing with acetaminophen? Granted, they probably had had it in the past, yeah. could tell you. but Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, there's a, about a third of those patients at high dose might have a reaction. So, you know, I would probably say come in for like a, you know, 650 challenge, like a lower dose challenge to prove you don't react to that. And that would be just the dose that they would stay at. Okay, very good. Um, my second question is, um, if they if a patient undergoes debulking of their polyps here and you are going to desensitize them after that with aspirin what's the usual time frame that you want to try to get them in i'm not familiar with how quickly those polyps will start to grow back so is that something you need to do within weeks within a month of post surgery recovery or what? yeah ideally we do like probably 4 to 8 weeks okay. um i don't think it's critical but that because we usually are partnering with ENT, we already have it set up. So we just like surgery date is, you know, August 15th, and then we'll plan on doing the aspirin on September 15th. So okay. that's roughly how most of us do it. Um, but, you know, I think you could even do it three, four months out because you're not going to have, usually not have such, you know, aggressive polyp regrowth that it'll be problematic at that point. It's more that it's just starting to come back. Okay. And then my last question, and then I'll hush up after that, is has anybody looked at using two biologics, so uh, like omeluzumab and dupilumab, targeting different areas? Uh, not, I think there's case scattered case reports of it. I mean, I, I definitely hear about that in other situations, like, you know, ADPA and allergic fungal sinusitis. Um, I'm guessing that there are going to be a few patients with ADRD out there on two. Um, I don't have any. Um, so, you know, I think there'd have to be pretty extenuating circumstances uh, for that, right? Um, but I don't, th I, I definitely don't think that that's like a, at all common uh, theme with, with this group. Sure. Yeah, I'm sure with insurance, it'd be difficult to get around that. Um, so, okay. All right. Uh, do we have any, uh, any questions from the audience? Hey, well, thank you for the talk. Um, and so... And I guess, um, I guess this is me just kind of pondering, but I am kind of curious, like how many patients like we may kind of miss who do have um, AERD just because they've never taken a like aspirin before, like who have the whole setup, I mean, of everything else, but just haven't taken aspirin. And I guess, uh, you know, and I guess it's maybe even like a piggyback off of Dr. Miller's first question, but, you know, um, and if they do have the whole setup, like, is it meant to like, is it beneficial just to see um if they have the aspirin t sensitivity just because it could give them benefit i don't know if that kind of question makes sense but like you know i'm just through your talk i mean I'll, like i just kind of pondered like how many patients we probably miss them because they haven't had aspirin before like if that makes sense yeah yeah no i think it's a it's a good question because it's you know despite the fact that a lot of these patients are probably going to end up on a biologic nobody's really giving them advice on what to do about aspirin and so you know let's say someone goes on dupilumab and they, um, no one really well characterized whether they're truly having ERD or not. Now they're doing great on dupilumab, but they still have a, you know, probably a 40 to 50% chance that they're still going to react. Um, so, you know, that's our job is to help guide them on that, right? And so it's still important that we get the history up front as, before we put them on a biologic. I think it's it's fine to punt it and say like, well, let's get you on, you know, if we're going to do a biologic anyways, let's do that and then have you come in for an aspirin challenge in, in six months. But, you know, if their history is rapid polyp recurrence and alcohol intolerance and they don't take any NSAIDs and they have asthma, they've probably got a, you know, 30 to 40 percent chance of having a ERD. And so they need they should know that, um, right, because otherwise they get a migraine and then they take ibuprofen and then you know they're in the er with wheezing so mm, got it yeah thank you for that yeah all right
Uh, Dr. White, thanks uh, for contributing to conferences online and allergy. Appreciate this. Another fantastic talk today. Um, we'll have this uh, edited and uploaded within about two weeks, so it'll be available on YouTube. If people go to ACAAI COLA, um, they'll be able to find all, all of our presentations. So thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Okay. Thanks.